It's like, you're not gonna get where you want in a week, yep. in a month. Uh, and I'm gonna say, you know, you can make progress. You can make progress in a month. You can make progress in three months, in a quarter, in a year. But sculpting the body that you want and reducing overall adiposity is a long-term game. All right, well, this is going to be fun. We yeah. are, I, you know, Mindy and I, we are doing an AMA. I will welcome you to my podcast. And I know that I am going to be on the Resetter podcast. So this is, this is going to be fun. We're going to see how this Yeah, goes. it's really fun. And for me, this is a first and I, and I love collaboration. Like collaborating is my jam. So this is really exciting. Yeah. And we should just quickly on the origin story of this, I was doing uh, some, I was doing like an ask me anything on my Instagram stories. And someone was like, can you and Mindy please do something together? And I was like, oh, that's so nice. And I was like, Mindy, I'm game if you are. And you're like, I'm up, I'm up for it. Let's do it. And so, as you said, collaboration. um, And I love, um, you know, I always get a lot of positive comments about the podcast that you, when you were on my show, I actually think it's in the, the top 10. Same with us. Same yeah. with us. When you were on mine, it, it was like, like women came out of the woodwork and it's, I think it's in one of our top 10 as well. Amazing. Yeah. So I'm happy that we're doing this again. And then, you know, if you all love it, so on the better podcast and on the resetter podcast, if you love this, then tell us and we will, we will, you know, maybe make this a little thing who knows how it, how it's going to go. I love it. Yeah, sounds good. And I also want to say that when we decided to do this, you and I both went to Instagram and said, what questions do we have? And when we got the, I, I was like, I wonder if we have a handful of questions. Wow. We have <laughs> yes, like we have so many questions. Yeah. Uh, we are not at a loss for questions. No. And, you know, I was saying, uh, I was saying to your uh, assistant before we started recording, I was like, I was really surprised that we didn't get the what breaks your fast question. But oh. <laughs> man, did we get, we got so many questions on fasting, muscle building, you know, menstruation, all, like how do we eat according to our site? Like so many great questions. Um, so I'm really excited. We have a lot, we have um, very intelligent uh, I would say, yes. uh, uh, listeners and followers. So they're asking really, really great questions. Agreed. Agreed. I love it. So let's get into the first one, um, which I thought was really interesting. And I thought the way that we might do this, and I think, uh, we were already talking about this in the pre-chat is like, we can just sort of banter, like we'll answer, yep. you know, the questions, uh, we may or may not have, uh, you know, the same, uh, answer for some of them. And that's completely fine. I think yep. that, um, you know, you and I are very aligned on, on many things, but of course there may be some extra color that I may add in a certain way or some extra color that you may add in a certain way. Of course, way. Um, which is so great. The- I think that's, I think so too. That's the part of a good discussion is bringing new information to a topic. So I love it. Beauty. All right. So first question, and I'll lob this to you and then I'll, I'll chime in. So one of the questions was, why is my blood sugar so high in the morning when I eat a low carbohydrate diet? Ooh. Okay. So, uh, this is one that I have seen in hundreds of thousands of our fasters online, and it really the the uh, statistical answer, I should say, or the the clinical answer is something potentially called the dawn effect, where when at night you're in a fasted state and there hits a point where your body registers that glucose is going down. And so the liver dumps stored sugar into your bloodstream to keep the brain well nourished. You know, we love ketones. They're great, but they're only 50 percent of the fuel for the brain. So when you wake up in the morning, I think it's a great sign because that liver is releasing that stored sugar. So I actually look at it as a positive sign. But for fasters, it's it's frustrating. And I also think um, you could think fasting isn't working for you, but it absolutely is. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that um, we, we do have to consider the Dawn effect here. So, of course, the Dawn effect, just as a little, you know, by way of history, was first noticed in in individuals with, with type 1 diabetes, where the insulin that they were taking, let's say the night before, wasn't sufficient to, uh, to uh, let's say, counter-regulate the glucose that was being released in the morning. And, of course, when you think about your physiology, um, 
in the morning, you have these uh, so-called counter-regulatory hormones that are increasing like cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine. And those are designed to release glucose into the bloodstream so that you have energy to, you know, from an, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, go and hunt, you know, take care of the children, you know, gather and hunt and cook and all the things. Um, but it's also observed in individuals who are following a low carbohydrate diet. And again, um, when you think about uh, when your cells are primarily burning fat for fuel, as they would when carbohydrates are dramatically reduced, um, we have to also consider the muscle cells, right? So the muscles uh, necessarily don't need glucose in, you know, overnight, but in the morning they will. Mm -hmm. And muscle cells, um, well, and I'll say, as you mentioned, the brain always needs some base level of glucose. So you can run on ketone bodies, as you mentioned, but glucose is the molecule of life. There's always going to be a requirement for some base level of glucose. So this is often referred to as like adaptive glucose sparing, where you're basically sparing the glucose that you have in the system for the brain. Um, and the idea here is that the the lack of glucose uptake uh, is happening you know, in the muscle cell, let's say, is happening for a beneficial reason. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not a harmful reason. And I think that one of the things that we can look at in context, if this person is, is um, concerned with that number, is also to look at her HbA1c, which is mm-hmm. sort of the, mm-hmm. um, you know, the three month, let's say, average of glycated end products or the, um, uh, the average level of glucose that you've had essentially over the last three months. Yeah. So all that, you know, all that sort of like preamble to say that it is very normal in a person having a, a following a low carbohydrate diet or someone who's fasting, yep. of course, which is the same, essentially the same thing. You're restricting yep. carbohydrates and everything else to have higher blood sugar, uh, blood glucose in the morning. Yep. What we do need to sift through is whether or not that's harmful, right? In a type one diabetic, you can make the argument that yes, that's harmful. But in the in the, in the situation where a, a woman or a man is following a low carbohydrate diet, is that harmful or is it just an adaptive that adaptive glucose sparing that we were talking about? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I would say in fasters, what I see is it's a temporary effect. It does not continue over time. Um, and then the other part of that, the application part of that that I really like is this is where if you're concerned about it, I really would put a CGM on and start to look at what's happening at two, three in the morning. That to me is so fascinating when you see blood sugar going down and then there's a spike at two or three in the morning and there it is. That's the body starting to release. So um, yeah, super interesting, but uh, you're right for a type one concerning, but for the majority of people, I, I think it's a temporary effect. And then the CGM is also going to give you other insight in terms of how your blood glucose and insulin dance, you know, happens over the course of the day. Like you're going to see, you'll see the spikes at 2 a.m. As you mentioned, you'll also see, um, you know, the variability in your response to stress in your your postprandial glucose spiking and how long it actually takes you to get back down. So I think that when we look at, and this is something that we're all guilty of, we tend to, we'll focus in on one thing. We're like, this is not perfect. Why? But you have to look at it. You have to zoom out a little bit and look at it in context. So if you slap on a CGM, you're seeing that 2 a.m. change, but also what's happening when you do start moving around or working out or, you know, you're presenting or you're eating a meal, like what's happening to your blood glucose in those scenarios. And then with that context, you can deduce whether or not you are in a good or bad, you know, position. Yeah. 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 Huge fan of CGMs. Love that. Uh, what's the next one you want to go to? Um, I, you know what I want to go to? Cause this one is, there's so much to talk about and, um, it's asked, I get asked all the time, how long does it take for the weight to fall off with fasting? Hmm. I'm going to let you go first on that one. Yeah, I'm going to give the, the worst answer. The, <laughs> this person who asked is going to hate me, but the answer I'm going to give is <laughs> it really depends. Yep. Uh, it depends on your age. It depends on your physical 
uh, uh, you know, your lifestyle, like how active you are, how much general movement, like that non-exercise activity thermogenesis that you're getting through the day, like just general putting or puttering around and walking, of course, structured workouts as well. Like, are you a cardio bunny? Are you lifting weights? What your, um, you know, your stress levels, like what your sleep is like, all of those things in addition to fasting is going to be a big determinant in terms of when she says weight loss, I also, I'm like a stickler for language. So I'm assuming she's talking about fat loss. Like she's not talking about reducing her bone density or reducing no, the size of I'm her sure. brain, right? We're talking about <laughs> I don't think reducing she wants her brain reduced. Yeah, no. exactly. So it's the adiposity. Like she's looking at reducing overall adiposity on the body. So I think that um, the first thing I want to say, and this is kind of more of a mindset thing, and this has just been my own experience with fasting, coaching other practitioners is every there's a so much bio individuality and you have to give yourself way more time than you would like <laughs> you know ah, like we, yes we oh. always are like oh you know what i've been doing this thing for a week you know it's not working i guess fasting doesn't work for me well it's you yeah. know in the same way i remember one of my mentors um in chiropractic, he said this beautiful thing is doc, uh, shout out to Dr. John Minardi. He was saying, you know, when you are have, you know, you're caring for a patient and you have been caring for them, let's say for six months. And at the end of the six months, you know, they say, doc, I feel better. And then would you ever say to them, which adjustment was it? Right. You know, which was the <laughs> one adjustment that helped you? It's yeah. like, no, it wasn't the one. It was the cumulative effect of going to the chiropractor, you know, I don't know, one time a week, two times, whatever it is. You know, you're going to the chiropractor for this program. You're doing your rehab. You're doing your stretches. It's the same with fasting. It's like you're not going to get where you want in a week, yep. in a month. Uh, and I'm going to say, you know, you can make progress. You can make progress in a month. You can make progress in three months, in a quarter, in a year. But sculpting the body that you want and reducing overall adiposity is a long-term game yep. that we see so often. Is, and I see this all the time in the online space where I'm just like, don't eye roll, like just, you know, respect everybody. <laughs> but sometimes you'll see sort of experts say, oh, you can, you know, drink, uh, I don't know, lemon water and you're going to lose 40 pounds in the next oh, two weeks. No. And it's like, I would never want to lose 40 pounds in the next two weeks because no. that's all muscle. Like that's, like that's cachexia. Um, so I guess my, I, I'm not fully answering this because, you know, I, you know, I'm a doctor, but I'm not her doctor, Right. but I would say that it re there's a lot of different things that go into losing weight when fasting. Yes. What, what do you many, think, Mindy? Yeah, too many variables for sure. Um, so uh, let me start with the mindset. The first thing is that I would love to redefine what extra weight means and why it's there. I really, our body is designed so intelligently that when it starts storing weight, we want to villainize it, but literally that extra weight is saving your life. It has to find a place to store extra glucose, store extra hormones, store toxins. And it does it around the back of your arms, your belly, your glutes. And it, and it's doing that instead of putting it around the organs. So let's start with, thank you, intelligent body. I appreciate you storing it there. Now, let me see what I can do to go after the storage. Now with that, if we're going to use fasting as a tool, to me, the first step is get comfortable compressing your eating window, get comfortable with like a 13 hour fast, uh, where you're, e and then you're eating, uh, what would that be? 11 hours and slowly work on condensing down that eating window, elongating the fasting window. When you get to about 15 hours of fasting, then my question to you would be, are you getting into ketosis? Are you seeing signs that you're getting into making ketones? If you're not, then you got to do the, there's like 20 million different check boxes that you got to think about. You got to think exactly what you were saying. How's your sleep? What are you doing workout wise? How's your food? Like we've got to go and that's where the bio individuality really comes in. And for everybody, it's a little different. Now, if you say, I'm in ketosis, but I'm not losing weight. Then my next step would be if it's a woman, are we are we fasting according to our cycle? Because if you're fasting at the wrong time, you're actually harming your body, causing your body to hold on to more weight. So make sure you're fasting to your cycle. If she says 
I'm, do, I'm fasting to my cycle, then I really go to toxicity. We've got to look at pulling toxins out. So I like to step it out in that fashion, um, but it starts with not chasing a number on the scale and understanding why the extra weight is there in the first place and then creating short little steps that and hurdles that you got to get over to start to see where weight may drop off of you with fasting. Yeah, well said. And like that permission and that grace to say, I'm going to give myself a really long runway for this. Yes. Like I've budgeted three months, but I'm just going to like double or triple that so that we can, because you're also in that journey. There's going to be, everyone also thinks about, you know, weight loss or fat loss as this sort of linear journey. Like I'm going to lose one weight this week and then next week I'm going to lose one pound and then I'm going to lose one pound the week after. And it's not like that. Sometimes you'll lose four pounds in a week and then nothing will change for two weeks. And then maybe another pound will come. It's very nonlinear. It's no. very, it's, it's very, uh, sometimes very disorganized yeah. or it can appear disorganized to our sort of linear, uh, brains that are really, uh, you know, designed to see things in like a stepwise fashion, but you'll yeah. notice over time, the net net again, like, which is the one adjustment, which is the one fast that, you know, that created the change. It's the accumulation of the healthy behaviors and the habits that are going to get you to where you want to go. And this, this, this applies to fast, you know, if it's weight loss with fasting, you're using a tool like, uh, you know, maybe a ketogenic diet or, you know, or otherwise it takes a really long time. And I, you know, just, I'll throw this in and we can, we'll move to the next one. But I often have women that'll say like, I've been working out and I don't understand, like, where's the muscle? And it's like, do you know how long it takes to build muscle? Right. Right. It takes a really long, like, you know, years to build mature muscle. Yeah. Um, So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. And I also want to just point out if if it's a woman that asked this question, which I'm thinking it was that if you start fasting with um, your husband, your brother, a a male counterpart, they're going to drop weight very, very quickly with intermittent fasting. And we are more complex than that. So also make sure that you're staying on your in your own lane and creating your own fasting journey for weight loss. Yes. Yes. What are the health books that you recommend or that you like to read, Dr. M, Dr. Pels? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I, I'm like a book hound. I cannot, I cannot get enough. Um, I don't even know right now. I would say that it really, I'm in mindset. I go through phases, so I can't just tell you one right now. I am absolutely hundred percent obsessed with the brain and, um, mindset. So currently one of my favorites is effortless. Have you read that book? No. Uh, Greg, no. McE- Greg McEwen, I think his name is. Mm. Um, and it's all about living life from an effort, effortless place. Um, I've also been geeking out on Dawson Church's books. He has Mind Over Matter and The, um, the Bliss Brain. So I've been diving deep into that. Um, I would say, yeah, I would say when it comes to books, this is pretty funny as an author of health books. <laughs> I'm like, I go slant towards the mindset and the brain books for inspiration. And I devour more of my health information, fasting, keto in, um, in podcasts and, uh, uh PubMed articles and, and conversations like this. So, Um, I will say that my absolute favorite book that I think every woman needs to read is Rushing Woman Syndrome by Libby Weaver. So if you haven't seen that, I would definitely, definitely do that. Um, I have, uh, you know, one book that actually really changed my life years ago was a book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain, Mm. which uh, which is a book about visualization. So I'm making notes as you're talking. Yeah, I I have a really eclectic book behavior, (laughs) Um, but I have books all over my house. I have I sit down. I don't always read them cover to cover. Sometimes I just pick them up. I read pieces of them. Um, So too many to really to highlight one specific one. I tend to agree with you. I I like the um, I think even when we're talking about nutrition and weight loss, you know, one big pillar that nobody like it's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to acknowledge is how we actually 
relate to ourselves, how we view ourselves and our worth. Um, so of course I'm going to give a shameless plug to the menopause reset. Great book. <laughs> I know, Dr. I was like, Pell. I'm, I'm like, I should have said the Betty body. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm going to shamelessly plug it. You should also pick up the Thank Betty you. body. <laughs> But oh, to your you. point around mindset, I, I just finished, uh, I actually just interviewed Gabby Bernstein. Mm. Uh, her book, uh, Happy Days is phenomenal. Mm. Uh, and she talks about this uh, principle, I guess, in psychotherapy uh, or in psychology called uh, internal family systems that we have all of these different parts to us. We have like the protector part and we have the, you know, the little, it's kind of like the inner child who's really scared. And then like, you know, the, the beast that can come out to sort of protect that uh, inner child. So I had a, I thought that that was in reading that book in preparation for our conversation. Mm. I loved Dr. Shafali's radical awakening, mm. I think should be required reading for every woman. Um, and then Nicola Perra's uh, mm. how to do the work I thought was a really good uh, in terms of just becoming aware of our just becoming consciously aware i think so many of us sort of like wake up you know and we're asleep through the i mean we're you know we're awake but you know we're we're not conscious of the thoughts that we're having how the past shows up in the present and i thought it was a really good book on uh, increasing your awareness, becoming aware of how to interact with yourself when you get mm. when you get activated and triggered, and how to reparent yourself and the inner child. Like I thought, those were uh, those have been um, books that you know that I've read in the past couple of years that I thought were just exceptional. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that how I use books is maybe different than just oh, I need the information in my mind. So, and this might be why I gravitate to these mindset books. Um, I have a morning ritual. I get up, I make my cup of coffee and I sit in the same chair. I call it my thinking chair. And when my brain is just sort of in this daisy place, that's actually when I read. And the idea that I have behind it is that you're not in high beta wave brain state yet. You're a little more in that alpha kind of state. And that's when you can get information into your brain in a, in a better way. I do the same thing at night. I'll pick up, I have a couple of books that I'll read, even if it's a paragraph before I go to bed, uh, as opposed to sitting and looking at Instagram before I go to bed, I will take, pull out a book, I get into bed and I'll read one or two uh, paragraphs if I can make it that far. Uh, and then I have that positive information going into my brain as I'm going into a sleep state. So and when you're in bed, do you make sure that those are mindset books that you're reading? So yeah. you know that they're going to be a positive, like you're not going to read like a horror, no, you know, like a no. fiction or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, you know, the one book that is like changing my world and I've read it a thousand times, but I always come back to it is Letting Go by David Hawkins. Mm. And whenever I feel like I get into bed and the mind is racing, like, oh, tomorrow you got to do this. And today this didn't go well. Um, I read Letting Go and I don't know what it is about that book, but it like instantly I can feel my whole body relax and then boom, I can fall asleep. I have uh, I have a like four or five books sort of piled up on my uh, nightstand and I have the same thing. I'll kind of pick them up and I, I, I pick off where I've left off the last time, but I don't necessarily do them in order. No. One of them, one of them that I have started uh, rereading is uh, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, oh, Victor Frankl. Yes. And it's just, um, you know, when, when you think about the horrors that that man lived through and the, the perspective that he had, it's like, you know, if he can do something like that and maintain a positive attitude and hope for the future, you know, living in Auschwitz and living through Auschwitz and, and the several concentration camps that, uh, uh, that he survived through. And then the aftermath, like how he, um, you know, how he took that information and lived his life after and yeah. taught other, I, I think that that's, again, another incredible book and I'll pick it up and it's so heavy, it's um, so heavy. but I'll, you know, again, like read a page or two, as you were saying, and then I'm like, yeah. okay, this is, this is good you know, for me. That book, when we first went into the pandemic, I had read that book already two or three times. Uh, but we did a book club in my reset Academy. I was like, oh, we're going to, we're great. coming back to this book because look at this man had a worse situation than any of us are in right now. And look at what he did in that situation. But 
the reason that book really is so good and everybody should read it is he literally goes through the day to day. Like, how did he stay alive? What did he do when he went back to his room and people were dying? And he talks about how the people gave up and they had no purpose. It's it's a classic. I'm so happy you said that one. Everybody needs to read that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay. I'll throw one at you. Um, Well, let's let me let's go to sleep because this is another one I've been working on mastering. The question is, what do you do when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep? But I want to also add into that. Do you have rituals around sleep and how to get a good night's sleep? Yeah, I have hard, uh, I have sort of hard and soft rituals, let's say in the evening. So I always try to, especially now the weather's getting, you know, really nice. And um, I try to get some evening sun. So I like to get early morning Mm -hmm. sun. Like for me, sleep starts, you know, in the morning. (laughs) Yeah, it does. It really does. Getting early morning light. You know, you were saying you have a thinking chair. I, I have like a little cup of espresso. I go outside. It doesn't matter. I mean, I live in Toronto, so we have yeah. like full on winter, it's cold. And then we have beautiful spring, beautiful summer. So it doesn't matter what time of year. I always go outside. It's usually in a, like if you're watching this on YouTube, it's like on a, with a tank top like I'm wearing now. And if it's in the winter, I don't last too long. But, you know, in the summer, I'll stay out there, listen to the birds and all that. And um, so I like to get that low solar angle sun. Like I'm trying Mm -hmm. to get to the sun, um, for a variety of reasons that we can certainly unpack, but of course that revs up the, it stimulates, you know, you, you stimulate the retinal ganglionic cells in the eye, which connect directly to the supra, uh, chiasmatic nucleus, which is sort of the center clock, master clock, if you will, of the body. Um, and that sort of rev things up. It helps you sync your circadian rhythm, if you will, to the sun. Yeah. Um, so I do that. Um, I try in the evening to get sunset light as well. So I try to get that and that low solar angle, like in the morning, you know, we always hear about blue light is bad and it's true. That's true. Blue light is bad, but it's bad in the evening. It's actually really important in the morning. Yeah. We need to have that green and blue and like really, um, sort of powerful light in the morning. And then in the evening, I try to get sunset light so you know some, you know in Canada and like sometimes that's at four. Oh god <laughs> and you know like it gets you're dark asleep you know at six. yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know now it's you know now it's it's light until I don't know six o'clock maybe um so I try to get that sunset light um and then again for that reason right so now you're getting like the red light the orange light which is signaling to the body you know like their sunset you know we're trying to um not inhibit the release of, of melatonin, which is what the blue light does, which you need in the morning. You don't want to be sleeping in the morning. Yep. Um, so that's what, I, those are quite, sort of like my hard rules, if you will, like getting sunlight uh, at specific times of the day. And then I would say the other sort of hard rule that I have is like no devices of any kind. So typically I will shut off, you know, sometimes it's, I can't always do this. You know, there's, so I have a deadline that I have to meet. I have, I'm in front of my computer, but I definitely have glasses on uh, in the evening, but I try to shut down all work by six mm. or seven o'clock. Impressive. Yeah. Uh, that's, and for me, I have, you know, I, I still have young kids, so they're home at that time. So it's Mm -hmm. important that I'm prioritizing family time with them. So maybe that's, you know, walking or we we're playing, we're, um, my uh, younger one is into puzzles right now. So like we'll puzzle a little bit, um, that kind of thing. So those are some of the, the rules that I sort of set around, electronics. Uh, like you said, no Instagram in the evening. I really try to, I find that the more I'm on Instagram, the more negative my mood is. Mm, you know? That's so interesting. I, I have found the longer I spend on it, the, the, the crappier my mood is. So I mm. generally will try to go on let's say in the morning, uh, or I try to like update my community in terms of what's happening in, in, you know, in, in my world. Um, but I try to get on once and then leave it. I mean, there's some times where I find myself like I've opened my phone and I'll, I'm uh, suddenly in Instagram. Oh. I don't know how that happened. Like just <laughs> automated. I found it and I'm in it. I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, that totally yeah. happens to me. Yeah. That's- so I, I'm trying to be a bit more conscious around that. Um, mm-hmm. And then let's see any other rituals. Like I try, Oh, the other big thing I do is I try to make the outside, my inside of my home look like the outside again, Mm. trying to like sync with the sun. So in the winter time, yes, we have dinner by candlelight because at that point it's dark. Um, 
And in the summer, you know, we're up later, we're having dinner a little bit later because it's later, it's, it, you know, the, the sun is, is, you know, higher in the sky for longer. So I try to, you know, no lights on when it's dark outside, you know, especially yeah. from up above. And I try to be in complete darkness in the bed as well, like so blackout blinds, that kind of thing. Wait, wait, I just, I don't want to let this comment go by. You have dinner in candlelight? Yeah. So in the wintertime, when it's like I was saying to you, you know, it gets dark at like you know, four or five. Right. So for having dinner, like my family usually has dinner around five or five thirty. It's completely dark outside by that point. So at some right. like in, in the sort of dead of winter, if you will. So yeah. we don't turn the lights on. I try Amazing. to keep all the lights off and we have dinner by candlelight. And it's this beautiful kind of, you know, like a little romantic throwback, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So it's nice um, for the kids. And then uh, we have and then the only thing I'll do. Um, uh, when it's dark is I'll have those little um, night lights that you can plug into the, mm. you know, the floor, like yep. into the plug in the floor. So again, the light is coming from below, not above. And then, you know, that's also just so that we don't fall down the stairs, but all, yeah. the, all the lights <laughs> typically in the house are off other than, you know, uh, like night lights that will illuminate like the hallway, let's say, or the stairs. Um, oh my God, then, I'm going to do that. I yeah. love that. I love that. So do you, then my guess based off of what you just said is you don't wake up in the middle of the night. Not really. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. And how, remind, remind me how old you are. I am 44. Double okay. fours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, double fours. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's chat when you're 54. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yep. I'm still All cycling the- pretty regularly, like no hot flashes, yeah, nothing. Yeah. 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 You probably, you probably, cause that's what I've noticed is that when I play with all the principles that I need to be in alignment with my perimenopause, menopause hormones, when I'm really spot on with my lifestyle, I sleep great. Mm-hmm. And if I fall off cue with any of it, then I'm waking up in the middle of the night. So a mm-hmm. uh, couple of things I would say on this topic, I agree with you about light. If I am waking up in the middle of the night, actually the first thing I think to myself is, did I see the sunrise today? Did I see the sunset? Did I get out in the middle of the day? Right. So I start with light first. And um, oftentimes, you know, what's the hardest? Sometimes I'm not getting out in the middle of the day. And like, so now I've put into my routine, at least a 20 minute walk at around noon, if I can do it so that I'm out without sunglasses on getting that direct light, just trying to get my circadian rhythm. So I like um, that. I'm going to take that and use that. I don't do that. I mean, I'm work. I can look up and I'm like, oh, it's three. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 And and I think where I was fooling myself is like right now we have we live across from a beautiful rose public rose garden. And I and I'm looking outside, I'm seeing the light, but it's not really full, fully registering in my brain. So I have to get out and get into it. So light is the first thing. Um, We've been also trying to turn lights off at night. We haven't gone into candlelight, but I love that idea. Mm -hmm. Um, We are actually officially empty nesters for the first time. So we used to be eight o'clock dinner eaters because the kids would come home from sporting events. And this is the only time that we could get all four of us to sit down together. Now we're eating earlier. We're turning the lights down. Um, I have a whole ritual around sleep. I'm doing my infrared sauna um, after dinner to calm my nervous system down. I have a PEMF mat that I go from there to the PEMF mat. Um, I, my husband knows like no stimulating conversations. Like we started debating politics and pandemic. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, no, 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 we can't talk about this at night because yeah. for me, I'm really easily uh, wound up And I had, uh, I interviewed Ben Lynch on my podcast and he ran a a genetic profile on me. And he said, um, oh, you are quick to make dopamine. You just can't get rid of dopamine. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. So I've learned about four o'clock, wind Mindy down. And so that's why I have all those different rituals. Um, When I go to bed, uh, again, I'm going to keep going after this because I've had to hack it through menopause. Um, I have a chili pad. I don't know if you have ever used a chili pad. I have used it. Yeah. Do you like it? I did. Yeah. I like, I don't have it anymore. Um, yeah, but I do, I do like, I did like it a lot. I think that, and for many women going through menopause, it's like this 
was the thing that saved them, right? Because yes. it gets so hot and bothered overnight. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, I, my thing on Chili Pad is it saved my marriage too, because I mm-hmm. ended up sleeping in another room at when menopause was really bad. Um, and I, it was like a refrigerator in the room. And my husband's like, I can't do this. This is way mm-hmm. too cold. Mm-hmm. Once I got Chili Pad, we had our own temperatures. We could do our own things. It was really cool as far as that. Um, I also have a weighted blanket. I love weighted blankets. Um, and, and if I do all those things on, and then read something positive before I go to bed, like I'm really pretty good. Now, if I wake up in the middle of the night, I've done some things around like vagus nerve stimulation where you can, and this is came from a book called accessing the vagus nerve, where I literally will like look up into the right for what I think is about a minute as far to the right upper right corner that you can see. And then you go up into the left for a minute and you keep going back and forth and it stimulates parasympathetic activity. I've done four, seven, eight breathing at two in the morning where I in through my nose for four minutes, hold for seven out through my mouth for eight. So those are kind of the hacks. The thing I absolutely do not do when I wake up, but I try not to do is solve all my problems. That doesn't work at two in the morning. And I have to go to think of something happy, do some breathing, access the vagus nerve. And if I do all of that, by the time I'm figuring that out, I'm back asleep. You said something really interesting around eye position that I just wanted to highlight. Um, And I think that this is why maybe sometimes I notice when I'm on Instagram, let's say that I feel like I'm just getting like agitated Mm -hmm. when you're moving your eyes uh, across the horizon. This is very parasympathetic, you know, so you said up into the, like, you know, to the far reaches that your superior oblique maybe can, you know, can afford, right. you know, you're it, looking, yeah. it's, you're, it, you can feel your eyes sort of like stretching. So yes. yeah. Yeah. And that, that horizontal movement is, uh, you know, it's, um, it's like the pontine, I forget the, I forget the nucleus, but it's in the pons. Um, and it's sort of at the pontine medu- medullary junction. And there's a nucleus that my mentor is going to probably send me an email about and like, how could you have forgotten this? But, you know, but the, it's, it's in the, it's in sort of the brainstem, let's say, and then moving your eyes this way, like left and right, uh, is actually part of the, you know, EMDR therapy, right? When you're trying mm. to follow the light left and right is very, very parasympathetic and a allows mm-hmm. you to uh, to calm down. And that's why the scrolling on Instagram, like if you notice, you're like mm. always going up and down. That's very sympathetic. Uh, you know, that I, uh, you know, that I movement up and down is very uh, sympathetic in, um, in its nature. And so the, uh, well, well yeah. said, I hadn't even thought of that. I love that thought. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to just mention uh, when that, you know, that question was like waking up in the middle of the night, can't get back to sleep. I think that there's so much sleep anxiety you know, Mm. uh, around like having to sleep perfectly. And like we were talking before we started about, you know, how my HRV is sort of, you know, kind of always in the, you know, in the tank a little bit. Um, And I have theories on why that may be, but sometimes it's, you know, just taking the pressure off of like, okay, I need to get back to sleep because even just that thought process is going to be stress inducing. Like, God, I'm not sleeping right. And then my HRV is going to be wrong. And then, you know, (laughs) so I think, you know, just lying down in bed, knowing that closing your eyes and, you know, you're not moving your, your body in and of itself is resting Mm. and recharging. And, you know, if there's one of the things that I usually do as I, as I'm falling asleep is I, I find that I'm like thinking about, you know, things that make me happy, you know, like I'm Mm -hmm. dreaming about like, whether it's desires that I have, or it's a, you know, a great memory, like I'll sort of relive like a memory, you know, these sort of things can also just help put you in a state of receptivity for sleep as well. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. What are are your thoughts on deep sleep versus REM sleep? Because the other thing that I've done when I wake up in the middle of the night is the brain spins to, oh my God, I have a busy day tomorrow. I better get myself to sleep Mm -hmm. because I got to, I got to be on point tomorrow. And now what I've started to do is say, I just need at least an hour to two hours of deep sleep. I need at least 90 minutes of REM sleep. I know I can get that even if I only get five hours of total sleep. And, just and if you're that- waking up mid, mid, like if you're waking up at two, you've probably already gotten most of the deep sleep that you're going to get for that, that night anyway, because that deep sleep typically happens in the first half of right. the cycle. And then the non-REM tends, or the sort of light stages, if you will, tend to happen in the, in the latter half of the night as well. So I would yeah. agree with you there. Yeah. yeah. But that calms me down a little bit. It makes yeah. me go, okay, you're going to be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. But the mind for me at two in the morning spins. So I've had to, when I wake up, I'm like, Ugh! and so I've learned all these hacks so that I don't do that. 
Yeah, I love that. And I think we're, I think we're all like that. You know, when you're, when you wake up in the middle of the night, your frontal lobe's not online. You know, it's not like the, it's not like, okay, this is not a a reasonable line of thinking. You know, you're like, oh God, and like, I'm up and now I have this (laughs) and I have that, you know, so I I do agree with you, but I I think that there's a lot of sleep pressure, if you will, and sleep Mm -hmm. anxiety, you know, and that's, you know, from wearables and from, you know, books Mm -hmm. that have been, and like the, and we want to say, yes, sleep is really, really important. It's the one thing you can't really bottle, right? Yes. So, so it is, it is really important, but if you're not getting it, let's say you're, you're running, you know, you're going through menopause, let's say, and you know, maybe you don't have the chili pad or maybe you don't have, you know, the, the hacks that you're, that you're doing that work for you. I think being gentle on yourself and mm. being open to finding the solution is just going to reduce some of that pressure, you know, that anxiety, that sleep anxiety enough, that's going to allow you to sort of drift back off into sleep. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hundred percent agree. All right, so just with the menopausal, uh, you know, women, there's a, a question in here around the best supplements for menopausal women. Do you have thoughts on supplements? Um, I let me tell you why I don't like it because I want to start with this. You, you let's start with a foundation of a great lifestyle, especially when it comes to menopause. And that's really what the menopause reset was about is giving women five things that they, she can do to change in her lifestyle as she goes through menopause. So let's start there. Now, having said that, when it comes to some like go-tos that I think probably every menopausal woman needs, my absolute favorite is magnesium. Uh, I mean, menopausal women should just be like bathing themselves in magnesium (laughs) and and talk about not sleeping. If I don't have my magnesium, like my sleep is definitely off. So magnesium would be up there as a number one for me. Um, And then you've got all your herbs, you've got your maca and all that, you know, chase tree and things like that. But I feel like if you dial in your lifestyle and you add in things that you may not be getting the reason I love magnesium is you can't get it in your, in your food as well. And I, even if you're eating food from regenerative farms, I just feel like we're not getting it as much. Um, but then you're going to have to supplement. So magnesium's one, I would say zinc is another one for menopausal women, um, just to maximize hormone production. So I go to the minerals, but I'd really like to see her do great work with her diet and her stress and her fasting and, and minimize toxins and minimize stress and see if supplements are needed then. A hundred percent agree. I think the, the supplement as the name suggests should be supplementing all of the other things that you're doing. So I, when I was at, when I was sort of thinking about this question, the number one thing that I put as well was magnesium. I think that, you know, it's better than diamonds. You don't need diamonds. You need <laughs> magnesium morning and night. Like I love to take magnesium a little bit in the morning and then I, I backload a lot of my magnesium in the evening. And that actually, you know, coming back to that sleep question, the other thing I do in the evening is I take some magnesium. Yeah. 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 Um, Cause I find that it really helps. There's um, and then the, uh, the, I think if there's, you know, when we think about being a minimalist around supplements, like magnesium would be there. Um, if you are someone who's doing low carb or keto, uh, or you're just training hard, I think that an electrolyte mm. uh, supplement is really important. So I, um, I don't know if you um, use or know this company, but I really like Element, LMNT. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely love them because when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be a little dehydrated. I always take a little element in the morning. Um, and then that also helps with, um, you know, just the body to hold on to water, because if you're doing low carb, of course, you know that. And of course, if you don't, it, I'll just say this because there's always a comment when I talk about a supplement, it's like, you don't need to take that. You can also just do salt in your water. Yes. Um, but element is there's like sodium. I think there's potassium. I think there's some magnesium in there and I'm forgetting the fourth. There's four no, of them that are in yeah, there. Maybe chlorine. The, I, I think it's the three of the three of the biggies in yeah. there for sure. We, our community uses element all the time because when you fast, if you're not putting minerals back in, you're really depleting yourself. So, you know, it's fun. You know what I, I I like element because they have so many different flavors. So like literally before this interview, I decided, even though it's early in the morning, I was like, you know what? I had an early dinner. I'm going to break my fast early. So I had a little piece of, uh, 
gluten-free sourdough bread. I put some uh, almond butter on top of it. And then I sprinkled the chocolate salt element <gasps> on top of it. That is genius. <laughs> and a little bit of ghee. It was so good. Oh yeah. my gosh, you're giving me life right now. I <laughs> didn't even think to put it in my, like to drizzle it as a little thing yes. on the food. I do it on it cut up apples and I'll put nut butter. I'll put some like goat's cheese and then I'll take some of the, the chocolate salts. The one I love. I, like, I love I the chocolate it. too. I love that. And I love the seasonal, the watermelon. Oh my gosh. I die for the watermelon. Yeah. Yeah. That one's really good. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the mango chili one and all of those, yeah. those were meant to be mixers. Rob told me. Oh, no way. Yeah. So you put them in club soda and then you put like tequila or vodka in oh, there and you mix genius. it up so that you're now getting the electrolytes that are being pulled out from alcohol and it adds taste to it. But he literally made those as mixers. Genius. <laughs> so I haven't, you I've always just been drinking them in water and now I have like a new way to use them. I use like one or two of those sticks a day. I love that. Yeah. There you go. All right. Let's move into some of the cycle, some of the cycling questions. Do I, okay. So there's a girl, a, a woman here. Do I still try to figure out my cycle after a hysterectomy? I thought this was a really good question. Ooh. Oh gosh. I have so many thoughts on this and, um, here's what I will tell you. So the first is I think we can never lose sight whether it's a hysterectomy or post-menopause, we can never lose sight of the fact that as women, we have been cycling from the moment our period started, we have been in this rhythmic hormonal groove. So just because we've removed, uh, you know, I don't know if she had the, her ovaries removed from a hysterectomy, but just because organs haven't been removed doesn't mean we're not still cycling. So the answer is yes, you need to pay attention to your cycle. Um, but how do you do that becomes the next question. And um, you can do that for me. I can tell you as a, I'm 52 and I, just when I think I'm going to go into menopause, all of a sudden my cycle gets regular again. And so I've learned to know when estrogen is low, when progesterone is low, when I might need more testosterone, I've clued into my symptoms and then I can shift my lifestyle accordingly. The other, and I'm curious your opinion on this. The other thing we've talked about in my community with a lot of postmenopausal women is the fact that we, for our, many of us naturally cycle with the moon. So full yes. moon being ovulation. So like, if you take like the way I teach fasting, if a woman who had a hysterectomy, one thing you could do is just enter, look at what I recommend for ovulation for fasting, time that with a full moon and then follow the cycle of the moon. Beautifully said, I would say the exact same thing. And that's actually part of the, you know, in the Betty body, I talked mm. about that. So, you know, we talked a lot about like, you're in your reproductive years. These are the each week that you need to eat this way, train this way, you know, et cetera. But if you're someone who is no longer uh, in your reproductive years, meaning that you've moved into menopause, you still are a cycling being just yes. by nature of being a woman. Um, so I think that the moon or the lunar uh, ebbs and flows are a beautiful way to still modulate the way that you are training and eating and your stress. And even like, I, I notice, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't always pair up with the moon, uh, you know, in terms of like ovulate is full moon and I bleed on the new moon. Like a, some, I, like, you know, depending on the length of the month or whatever, sometimes I'm a little off, but I think that, um, it's a beautiful way to start noticing in how the moon affects your energy. Cause I always yeah. have way more energy around the full moon. Like yeah. that's usually the time where I'm like, gosh, I'm like up and I'm cleaning and I have so much energy and I have, you know, and I'm rearranging the furniture and that's usually the, you know, the time I'm like, Oh, it's, it's the full moon. That's why yeah. that's happening. Yeah. I actually think on that topic, we don't give nature enough credit for how it um, how synergistic we are with it, whether it's the moon, whether it's, uh, you know, just what cortisol levels change when we're out in nature, the microbiome. So I love that. And as women, I think we intuitively know this, that we're connected to these cycles, 
but we're, we don't have enough discussions about them and we don't aren't taught that by our doctor. And we're definitely not taught that in our sex ed course at, you know, class at 14 years old. But if you start to tap into the nature's rhythms, you'll see how as a woman, you are so intimately connected with nature's rhythms. Yeah, I love that. And to your point, uh, if the woman still has her ovaries, we also want to just like, and she doesn't have the uterus, let's say, of course, we know that the ovaries are the things that produce the hormones and the uterus is, you know, the, the thickening of the endometrial lining and then the eventual shedding of it. So if she still has her ovaries, uh, there's still going to be those hormones that are going to be produced, but there's going to be no endometrium, uh, you know, no, no endometrial lining to shed. So, right. um, we want to be, uh, and I don't think that was clear in the question. I'm not sure if she still has her yeah, cervix either, but um, I would say that the lunar cycle would be the best way to sort of just anchor yourself. So looking at the different phases of the moon, anchoring yourself to that. But yep. also if you do still have your ovaries, know that you can still have some of those like PMS type of symptoms. You can still run estrogen dominant or androgen dominant, let's say, yep. depending on the activity of the, or the balance or lack thereof, of the uh, hormones coming from the ovaries. Yeah, I think it, that's super important. We even have uh, one, a case in our fasting group where a woman had both her ovaries and her uterus taken out. Her doctor said, you're going to be in full menopause within three months. And a year later, she was still making hormones. And it went on for almost two to three years before she fully went into menopause. And he was shocked. But this got me thinking that when you pull an organ out, you don't, what we don't realize is you don't get all the tissue out. Like there can still be some of the, that tissue in there and the outer part of the ovary, the fecal cells, those are making these hormones. So if you pull out the organ, doesn't mean that there's not a little bit of production that can still happen, especially with a clean lifestyle. Beautiful, beautifully said. I have one, I have one I wanna make sure we, since we're on cycle, um, and I love this question. My daughter just started her cycle. What should be something I teach her that most people aren't? This was a good question. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that this was asked. I think yes. that um, when a when a uh, a young woman uh, starts cycling, one of the things that I don't think is discussed enough is the variations that can happen in her cycle in the first call it like let's say she's 12 or 13 let's say um, in the first five years of her cycling and i think that this is true for any skill right like you yeah. start you know you start learning to ride a bike you're not just going to be you know you're not just be doing bmx tricks like you got to learn <laughs> you got to learn how it goes right so i think that it's especially true for teenagers um that there you can look a little bit at times, a little PCOS-y, like you can sort of look a little bit androgen dominant. And that's really just your body, you know, just the develop, the normal developmental process. And the reason why I bring up that one specifically is that it's so often that let's say a, a girl starts menstruating, she's 13 or, or, you know, whatever it is, uh, 12, 13, 14. And then a couple of years later, she's like, oh, that's weird. Like I have these anovulatory cycles or I have these really heavy bleeding and then she goes to her, uh, we'll say allopathic physician, because you, 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 know, you might not necessarily think like, I'll go to my naturopath, you might go to, let's say your uh, medical doctor. And this yep. is usually the time where she gets a prescription for the birth control pill. It's like, mm -hmm. well, you're 17, 18, you're probably going to be sexually active, if not already. And you have this wonky period. So here's something that's just going to fix that. And of course, yep. we know that that's incorrect. It doesn't fix anything. Mm -hmm. There's just some aberrant, you know, modulate like some, just some variations in her cycle. That's, that is, uh, equivalent with her age. Mm -hmm. So I just want a lot more moms to be aware of that because your daughter is going to come to you and say, I've had the, I've, I haven't had my period, let's say for a month, you know, you take the pregnancy test, it's negative. And then, you know, the next time she gets it, it's really weird. Then it's erratic. And then they go to the doctor and it's like, well, you should probably be on the pill. Yeah. And that's not what's happening. It's, it's just sort of a, uh, I've seen See this so so much with my my teenagers like these teenage uh women where the mom's like we didn't know like we went to the doctor yep. and they gave us the pill and you know they 
and this kind of bridges on the topic of informed consent, but we don't actually talk about the risks around taking the birth control pill because there's never any game plan to get her off of it. It's just always like, well, you're 18 now, you should be on the pill. And then we, on the other side of that, then we'll have women who are in their, let's say mid thirties that have been on the pill since they were 16 or 17. They want to have a baby now. And then they don't have their period because they essentially haven't had it for decades. And they're like, no one told me. So that's something that I really feel very strongly about. I think that there needs to be a conversation around a informed consent. And if you're going to take the pill, like, you know, love you and like, no matter what, right? right? Like take the pill. If that's what you feel is the right decision for you right now, but also be aware that there's risks and then just have an understanding going into those years where you're 15, 16, 17, 18, where your period can be a little bit of a, you know, it can be a little bit erratic and that's just very normal. Yeah. So well said. Uh, And what I would add on to that is I look at it like like when you're creating a walking along new grass, you know, you have to create a path where eventually you can see where you would go and walk every day on this piece of grass. It's the same thing when the hypothalamus pituitary and ovaries are first learning to communicate through this amazing chemical system. They don't quite have their rhythm down. And to your point, it can take five years for that rhythm to really happen. So if we come in with any form of birth control in that first five years, you're really disrupting uh, and manipulating that natural cycle and the body may not know what it needs to do. And then on the backside, when you are trying to undo that because you want to have a baby and you're 29 years old, that can be very difficult. So I think birth control in those early years it needs to be so well thought out. Now, the second thing I would say that this is a big, big uh, mission of mine right now is I feel like we need to have conversations with women more about how if you look at our hormones, we are meant to be a little emotionally uh, wild is what I'm going to say that we aren't our hormones because they're coming and going makes it so that our emotions are going to be coming and going. And all of us are going to experience emotions differently, but I feel like we don't, aren't given the platform to be able to be like, I'm teary today, or I'm irritable today. And instead we go, I'm PMSing and we kind of blame it on our hormones. But, you know, you're teary because of those hormones or in ovulation, when you've got tons of estrogen and you've got this surge of testosterone, you're you're a freaking rock star and you've got great mental clarity and drive and go ask for a raise, go handle that conflict during that time. So I have a 22 year old daughter. If I could go back and give her advice at 13 when she started her cycle, I would want her to understand these hormones as they are ebbing and flowing and how to work with them and when to nurture them. And you bring up a really good point around like shame and really accepting our physiology. I think that when I was, when I was, uh, you know, a new menstruator, we'll say like when I was, you know, (laughs) when I was new to the club, you know, like the worst thing that I could ever imagine was like bleeding through, you know, my pad or, you know, having someone like someone passing me a pad, someone seeing me, you know, take a pad, let's say, and going to the washroom. And I, I, I love what you're saying because there's, at least in, I, I think it's changing now because of the work that you're doing, the work that I'm doing. There's many others that are trying to bring awareness to the natural state of a menstruator, like what she looks like and how this Mm. impacts her brain, how this impacts her body, how this impacts the way she thinks. And if we can really start removing some of the shame. And I yes. love what you said around like asking for a raise around ovulation. Like if you can start planning your month around your cycle, how much better would we be? Oh my like, gosh. How much happier yeah. is like, I'm going to do a podcast recording. Like I'm in, you know, I am in my pre ovulatory week right now. Like <laughs> I am happy to be chatting with you. Cause I'm like people, I love people, you know? And like next week, not so much. Like I'm going to be a bit more into me, you know, right? because that's, that's what happens. Like we become just a little bit more introverted and, yeah. you know, that week before your period, you know, things are annoying you and things that, you know, you're agitated, you're teary, as you were saying. 
And I think if we can just begin to accept that we're not men, you know, that Mm -hmm. we're not these like, you know, smaller archetypes of men with like pesky hormones, that we are women and we have a different cycle, a different hormonal composition and honor that those, you know, different constituent, like those different hormonal landscapes, I think we'll be so much happier. And that's why I want like all the teenagers, like all the moms with daughters who are listening to this, to share this with their teen, like to yes. listen to it with their teenagers and then start having conversations around expectations. Because I think that one of the best things you can do as a mom or even the dads that are listening, you know, if you have that relationship with your daughter, one of the best things that you can do for them is to kind of let them know what's around the corner. Like Mm. expect this to happen Mm. because when it does happen, you don't misinterpret it. You don't Mm. misinterpret it as something's wrong with me. I'm teary. Something's wrong with me. I'm emotional. It's like if you as a mother or a caregiver can say, honey, this is what's going to happen, you know, around this pre bleed, like the week before you get your period, you may feel like this so that when the time comes that she's not misinterpreting her experience as something is wrong with her. Mm, So well said. Uh, Yeah, you just elevated my thoughts on that. Um, And this is really, again, why conversations like this is so important. And one of the ways I use it in my own life and through my menopause journey is I let the people around me know like, hey, I'm it's the week before, you know, I'm supposed to get my period. I'm very sensitive. I'm super teary. I don't want to go out. I know there's a great party to go to on Saturday night with all our favorite friends. I don't want to go. I want to sit on the couch and I want to eat carbs and I want to watch Netflix. And um, the more I've been able to explain that, they understand where I am a little bit better. And I think that's, it's all in the, in the um, linguistics of this and being able to communicate at a deeper level with each other. But we, but instead we're not given that we push. I, I think that week before our cycle is such a misunderstood week and we, we villainize it. We bitch about it. We don't take care of our health in it and we plow through it, but really we need to be nurtured. We need to nurture ourselves and slow down. When, when I first did, I don't know if you track your cycle on a clue app, yeah, I do. Clue is yeah. the one I use actually. Yeah. Okay. So the first time I started doing that at 43 years old, which cracked me up that that was when I first started doing it. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, you know how it has a little cloudy thing it shows there and like where your moods are. I'm like, I need to share this with my office staff. I need to share it with my kids. I need to share it with my husband and be like, if you just want to know what's going on with me, just go ahead and go to my clue app and you'll, you'll know where I'm emotionally at. Yeah. And I, I, that week, you know, I I wrote about this in, in my book. I know you've, you talk about this a lot as well. That week before you get your period, I think is a, is, is a sacred week. Yes. Truthfully, like we in like modern society is like, oh, she's on the rag or, oh, she's PMSing or whatever derogatory, you know, um, sort of slang that there is to denote that. But this is usually, and we, we talked about this when I was on your show. Um, this is usually when, you know, you're probably getting a little bit more irritated with your partner, Mm -hmm. maybe your friends, maybe jobs bothering you. But that is really a message from your body to say that there is misalignment here. Mm -hmm. You are more, you are exquisitely sensitive in this week to be able to pick up the areas in your life where you're not aligned. And so I talk about sort of the week before your period and then into the bleed week like these two weeks are so important in terms of problem solving because that week before you get your period you're like okay i can see what the problem is it's my relationship with my husband like there's some tension there's like unresolved residue that's still there from three months the fight we had three months ago or whatever or i can see what the problem is this job is sucking my soul dry right? Yep. And then when we move into the bleed week, we're now we're shedding, we're getting literally shedding the right. endometrial lining, we're getting rid of we're making space. This is where we can now problem solve. Yep. And I think I might have said this on your on the resetters podcast. Um, you know, I when when guys say like, okay, I'm going to have a think about it, you know, like, I'm going to think about it, and I'll come up with a problem, we need to bleed on it, we need oh, to bleed on the problem. Because as you bleed, you will as you shed, you will be able to come to the decision that is best that is most aligned with what what it is that you should be doing. 
Oh my gosh. I love that. Uh, that, that I'm going to noodle on that one all day. Um, <laughs> yes. the other thing I would say that I learned about my own self when I started to really dive into the hormones that were coming and going is the power of testosterone and how we really get it in big doses for about four to five days. And then it's, then it chills out. And I feel like if I had known that in my younger years, I think I could have had better conversations with my husband about like my libido and like, Hey, guess what? It's uh day nine and day 11. Yep. I'm going to be ready. And you're it. And I'm chasing you. <laughs> and you're it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so good that's so good um but instead you know i didn't realize that my libido may have ebbs and flows according to my hormones instead it was like I, if i compared myself to my husband men are getting testosterone every 15 minutes they're kind of ready to go and then i started to sort of feel like what's wrong with me and then once i understood when it came in i could i could definitely be like tag you're it yeah tag you're it and <laughs> one the other thing that i think is important for women to also know about testosterone i mean we we talk about it's like famous for libido and it's true as you were saying it's like you know, i'm chasing my 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 husband around the kitchen counter like i'm like it's you're it like and i'm and i want it right so there's there's that and then you know in addition to that you'll see like increased sensitivity of the clitoris so you're going to, your orgasms are going to be more, um, uh, powerful. But the other thing that I think is important around testosterone is, and I had this conversation with, uh, Sarah Gottfried, who I know, uh, you know, well, and she said this really beautifully and I'll, I'll try to paraphrase what she said. It was like, it was, it gives you a sense of your, it's, it's, it's like a sense of your personality, you know, it gives you that, you know, you were saying before, like ask for the raise, you know, like you, you, you take more risk, you know, you are much more forward, you're more open. And I think that one of the things that I think women lose, or they, they realize that they've lost, maybe if they're not, you know, lifting weights or doing some of the things that can maintain testosterone levels is as we age our, uh, you know, our proclivity for taking risks, our ability to be open begins to shrink. Like we have testosterone receptors in the brain. So I think it's really, really important to note that testosterone, yes, libido and sex drive and orgasms, and that's really important as well, but it also has a profound impact on our personality. And I think that, um, you know, things like lifting weights, and I know that there's some questions around fasting and lifting weights and stuff, which I will probably, maybe we can jump to next, but I think that trying everything that you can to maintain muscle, let's say, as a proxy for maintaining healthy testosterone levels, not only will help your sex life, which is important, but it's also <laughs> going to help your brain and your personality and the way that you show up in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And very good point. I have to say that in my late forties, the first, my first real understanding of testosterone was when I stopped craving working out. I was like, I, and I've, well, you know, I was a competitive tennis player in college. Like I've been an athlete my whole life. And it was like, why do I not want to work out? Like I would crave working out my whole life, except for now I'm 46, 47. I don't want to work out. That's when I realized, oh, it's because testosterone's low. So motivation and drive is also a biggie that I think we don't talk about enough with testosterone. Yeah. Speaking of which, how can I burn fat without losing muscle? Oh, okay. Well, I'll give you my favorite fasting protocol around this. And then um, I'm curious to hear what you say. Um, I think you've got to, you've got to have, find a really good balance between autophagy and mTOR. And my favorite hack is to actually be in a state of autophagy when you go and work out. So, uh, you know, typically fasting wise, that's about 17 hours, but everybody's a little different. Um, you go into your workout in a fasted state. You, you then go in and do like a strength training workout. And then after that, when you come home, you protein load and you break your fast with protein, specifically 30 grams of protein to hit that amino acid uh, sensor. And I have found that, that that on the days that I'm lifting weights is what will lean me out, but allow me to maximize my, my muscle growth. The second thing I'll say is that, and I will tell you again, as I age, I'm starting to really wrap my head around this more, 
is that protein, 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 protein. I think in the keto world, in the fasting world, we villainize protein a little bit because we're like, oh, it spikes your blood sugar, but it's really such an important macro. And if you're not getting enough protein, uh, it, you're not as good at not only building muscle, but you're not going to burn fat as much. So we need to make sure that we're looking at your protein load. Yeah, I love everything you just said. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that, um, you know, I've I've had, um, I used to, and I've done this for decades, train first thing in the morning, right? Because it was just the only time that it fit. Like it was the only time that I could kind of get it in. And I've had a couple of schedule changes recently where now, like right now I train five days a week. So I do two, and this was another question. So I'm answering this at the same time. I do two lower and I do three upper, uh, just because I'm trying to, as women in general, we are weaker upper, like we're weaker in our upper body. And I remember this from practice. Like I remember you know, we would do a test, like an intake for a patient. And I would say, okay, uh, we're going to test your leg strength. We do a wall sit. We do like balance proprioception. And then I would get them to do toes only push up, no knees, mm. which is, you know, they would call it the women's push up, which is like, oh, uh, yeah. I, get, like, I get like, an, I get like a little like nervous tick when I hear that. Cause I can't, it's like, it's not oh, a woman's push up. It's just no. a push up on your knees. You know, it's like, it, it's not a woman's push up. I do push ups on my toes. <laughs> So I would specifically say, I want you to do a push up on your toes. And most women, like I would say, uh, I don't know, out of a hundred women that I would see, like 95 of them could only do one. And then with that very poor form. So I have for decades trained fasted, as you said, and then I would I would do a protein and a carbohydrate bolus right after. So that would be like the 30 grams of protein, as you were saying, we want to, we want to, um, um, and you, and I would say that it's 30 grams of animal protein. Yes. Um, yes. Agreed. So like two, like, and you know, some, I would say, uh, like two and a half, maybe two to two and a half grams of leucine you're going to get mm -hmm. with like a 25 gram, let's say serving. So you're going to get about three grams of that with, um, with 30 grams. So you're, you're, you're stimulating muscle protein synthesis which is you've just broken down like the gym right. is where you break down your muscle tissue yep. and then you want to build it up afterwards so it's going to go through its own reparative process but you can amp that up by giving yourself protein right after yep and carbohydrates um, your muscles are very receptive post tra training specifically though so lifting weights specifically to take up the protein and to take up the carbohydrates because what carbohydrates do um, you know they're anabolic but they don't they don't create uh, new muscle protein, what they do is they prevent muscle protein breakdown. And mm. if your goal, if you are a 40 year old woman, 50 year old woman, 60, 70, 80 year old woman, your goal, one of your primary goals around your health should be to preserve muscle tissue. And the way that you do that and even grow it if you can, right. And the way that you do that, of course, is to have a net positive muscle protein synthesis. So you do that with the protein bolus. And I like to also add in the carbs because that, that prevents the mm. breakdown of muscle proteins. Yeah. So that would be, uh, what I would say, um, is what I most typically do now, just, I've had a couple of schedule changes, um, where I can't work out in the morning twice a week now. So now those, and that today is just happens to be one of those days. Like every Friday I will work out, um, around four o'clock. And so it's an upper body day. And what I've noticed is I also am getting really great strength gains from that as mm -hmm. well. And it's, you know, my body temperature is a little warmer. I've had a couple of meals, you know, whatever it is. So I think that you can absolutely gain muscle in, you know, and lose fat, do like doing a fasted workout, but you want to be strategic about pulsing the protein, as you were saying, as well as the carbs. And in, you know, we all, there's this talk in the keto community around, as you were saying, like villainizing protein, they also villainize carbs, you know, right. like carbs are, all, carbs and, you, are know, you want to talk yep. about mTOR, like yeah. what yeah. stimulates uh, mTOR more than protein is too much carbohydrates. Right. So the, and that's kind of where that fear comes from. But when you are strategically pulsing protein and carbohydrates, yeah. I think you can really make some incredible changes to your body composition. 
nutrition. So you can reduce the fat. Like if you're working out in a fasted state, of course, you're going to be going through a process of gluconeogenesis, but primarily you're going to be pulling on the triglycerides as, you know, the fat stores as your uh, source of energy. And then afterwards in that, you know, 24 to 48 hour, you know, depending on how hard you work, maybe it's 72 hour reparative process, you can be increasing your protein. And as a woman, as even this is true for men too, we become more anabolically resistant as we age. Yeah. And this is where I, I don't mean to throw shade at other researchers because I think that, um, a a lot of good work, uh, you know, people are doing this from the best of intentions, but this is where I tend to disagree with Walter Longo and Dan Butner around this like protein restriction as a marker for longevity, because we actually need more protein as we age to overcome that anabolic resistance that naturally sets in. So when I was 25 and I had a 25 gram or 30 gram bolus of protein, I'm going to be much more receptive to that at 25 than I am at 45. So you also have to be mindful that you are over time, you were saying 30, you know, grams of protein. So maybe at 45, you need 30 grams of protein, you know, maybe at 55, you need 35 grams or 40 grams of protein in order to have the same response physiologically as you had with the 25 grams when you were 25. Yeah. Yeah. I actually just would dove into some research on that, that just like we get insulin resistant, um, or we can get insulin insulin resistant, we age, we can get amino acid resistant in those muscles. So you need more as as you get older. So, and uh, to your point, I just want to point out, I'm not anti-vegetarian, but I do believe that it's really hard to get a complete uh, array of amino acids if you're a pure vegetarian. And that's personally why I eat meat. Um, I spent 10 years as a vegetarian, so I'm not again, anti it, but as I've moved into my fifties, like meat has, and, and eggs and all different kinds of animal protein is my jam. It's my go-to. Yeah. You can get there with plant proteins. It's just, you know, we want to be also like, you can, you can get to that minimum requirement of that two and a half grams of leucine in order to stimulate the muscle protein synthesis if you're vegetarian, but right. you do have to be mindful of the calories that you have to take in in order to get there because plant proteins are typically a we'll call it a less robust source yep. of that full complement of amino acids. So you typically have to have more uh, plant proteins like the rice or the soy or the you know, pea protein or whatever it is. You typically have to have more than the 30 gram scoop. You typically have to have one or two scoops. So you also want to take into consideration your caloric uh, intake as well, because yeah. then now you're kind of sort of, you know, maybe doubling in some cases, tripling uh, your calories in order to get there. So you can do it. You can get there with plants. You just yep. need a lot more of them. And diversity. I, I just read a study showing that if you are going to try to get all these amino acids, you're, you really need to open up like the diversity of the plant sources that you're getting it from. So yeah, absolutely. hundred percent agree. What do you do for, what do you do for, I know I, I was telling them what I'm, what I'm doing right now for training and stuff. What do you do for uh, your exercise regime? What oh my God. Like? Yeah. Right. At 52, it's been, it's been different. So the first thing I would say is in my forties where I, about mid forties, I actually had to stop the extreme working out and it was just too much cortisol for me. So I was running marathons and, you know, lifting weights. So I, about 45, I switched to more hiking, more walking. My competitive brain has to call it forward movement because when I say walking, I feel like I'm being lazy. So I'm (laughs) like, no, I'm just forward moving today. It's going to be good. Um, And then I started adding in a lot of yoga and um, using that more as my strength training, doing like a a vinyasa flow, kind of ashtanga, again, a little more of an aggressive yoga. Um, But I will tell you now at 52, I'm back in the gym, I'm back doing muscle work. Um, So I would say there's a combination. I work out five to six days a week and three of those days um, is muscle building. I love TRX. I love the the, um, resistance type training. Um, one day a week, I'll do a short hit workout where uh, I'll throw in some burpees Some I love burpees for some strange reason. Um, I'll do, you know, more of like just a, a cardiovascular up and down. Um, one day a week, I will do yoga. I don't do it three days right now. Um, and then I try to sprinkle in my hikes and forward movements in between all that. That's great. Yeah. That's really so, balanced. And I think when you're thinking about 
you know, the pillars of exercise and fitness, like certainly strength is one of them. Right. And, you know, let's just be honest. Like when you resistance train, like you look better, you know, like you're a little tighter, you build out your curves, all those good things. Like you get the aesthetic stuff, but the strength is there, which I think lends to confidence and, you know, it, it just, it feels good to be able to not need someone to, let's say, lift something for you or pick something up. Like you can do it yourself. But as you were saying, you know, the yoga, uh, I think is important as well, because one of the things that I don't think is, is talked about enough is as we age, you know, it, we have to be careful of like proprioception, like our, oh, our yeah. balance, yep. balance and proprioception and mobility. This is really, really important. That's not discussed enough. And, you know, we lose, it's like lo- use it or lose it. Like your body really will get good at whatever you're doing consistently. So if you're not doing something consistently, it's also going to say, well, this isn't important. So I'm just going to, you know, kind of dial this back. And, you know, as we age, of course, there's this, we were talking about anabolic resistance. There's also, if you're not, you know, training, we also become concerned around, around osteopenic, uh, or like, you know, the brittle, you know, the bones becoming more brittle and more pockmarked and leading to eventually osteoporosis. And then of course, joints degrading as well. Yeah. So not getting that feedback to the brain about where your joints are in space. Um, so I think that that what you're talking about with the yoga is really, really important. Um, and I'm right now where we're, I know you can't see it, but I'm standing on a, a treadmill that, oh. I, so I'm at my desk. So Are I get walking? a lot of my, and I, I'm not walking right now because oh. the audio, it would ruin <laughs> yeah. the audio I'm for like, the podcast. I'm like, I don't, you don't look like you're walking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but when we're not, when I'm not recording a podcast and I'm working at my desk, I'm, I'm walking. Amazing. So that's how I get a lot of my sort of low level, you know, that forward movement, as you were saying, yeah. like I get my forward movement working at the desk most of the day. Amazing. Um, but I think that the, the, I would say that if I'm being totally honest, like my personal proprioceptive work needs, needs a little, I got a vibe plate. I got all the thing. I got all the rehab stuff. Yeah. Um, but I got, I got to prioritize that. That's one thing I would work to be improving over the next year for sure. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, 52, the way I approach workout is so different than 32 at 32. It was, I need to work out to be able to keep my weight where I wanted it. Um, at 52, I'm working out for functionality. I'm working out for mental health. So when you start to change and you flip the reason you're working out, just to your point, like reason I've gone back into the gym to start to lift weights is because I could feel after like sitting for so long, my body sort of collapsing and I wanted more strength to be able to, you know, perform normal life. The reason I do yoga is because mentally I feel a lot better after it. The reason I go for a hike is the same thing. So I, it stopped becoming this weight loss tool and was more a total mental uh, uh, health tool overall. I would say that that's a useful tool. Like if there's any practitioners that are listening to that, that's also a really good, like you just dropped a lot of gold. I don't even think you realize how intelligent that was in terms of, you know, when we, when we're trying to help our female clients, sometimes we want to shift the focus from weight loss to performance. Mm -hmm. Right. And because a lot, I mean, so many women will say, I need to lose weight. I need to lose this. I need to look a certain way. And that's all fine. We all want to, we want to honor them where they are. Like, I still want to look, I still want to look good too. Like I'm not taking that away from you, but when, but when you, when you focus the, um, the goal on performance, like how strong can you get? How many, how many plates can you put on this barbell or how high can we get you on these kettlebells or dumbbells or whatever? I think that that also starts to gamify it. And, you know, for those of us that are competitive, you and me would be in this group. Then you're just, (laughs) then you're like, give it to me. You know, then you're like, I will get to those. I'm going to finish that rack. I'm going to go through the, up to the 25s. And then I want to go to the thirties and the forties and the seventies and whatever. Yeah. So, um, well said. Yeah. 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 And that's why I started calling it forward movement, because what I finally got to in my late forties was I just want to walk. I don't want to go for a run. And my brain would be like, well, that's lazy. And so then I started thinking, I'm like, but I'm, I'm still out in the sun I'm moving forward. It's helping the anxious brain. Like there's so much benefit just because I'm not doing it at the same degree that I did at 32 doesn't make me a failure. And that's, so I renamed it. I'm going for a forward movement experience. And here I go. I love that. That's <laughs> so great. It may look like walking. It might look like sprinting. I might stop and talk to a neighbor. I have no idea, but I'm moving forward. <laughs> I love that. And that's a nice parable for life, right? That's we always right. want to feel like we're in forward momentum. We want to feel like we're moving forward. So I love that's that right. too. That's great. I, I love it. 
Where do you want to go next, Doc? Well, I, I'm going to actually probably have to cut us off because okay. I because speaking of working out, I've got to go uh, grab uh, uh, in 15 minutes. I got to go meet with my trainer. All so right. um, but I love this. And you guys let us know, because if you love it, I feel like you and I could do this all day long. Man, I just had such a good time with you today. <laughs> like it's so fun. Yeah, and it's so it's always such a pleasure. You know, sometimes in pri- you know, in private practice I was really quite aware of this and even more so now where I'm more in the online space. It's you're not you don't have the opportunity to see people as much as you mm-hmm. might like. Yeah. Um so for me this has just been a joy. So if you uh, you know on the Resetter podcast, on the Better podcast where we're airing these both, we're releasing these both on the same day. Uh, if you loved this, then please let us know. Uh there's actually we didn't get to like half of the questions. Oh, I know. We we'll, got like <laughs> we have like 50 more questions, but Yeah, so we yeah. can certainly do part 2 uh and yeah. 3 really uh if there's if there's interest. So yeah. um I I hope you crush it on your workout. I hope yeah, you do, thank um, you. Yeah, have a great yeah. time and then we'll we'll see you maybe we'll do this again. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Thanks. I I love this as well. So, and uh you can turn your treadmill on now and yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And en- enjoy some forward movement in your office. I love so, it. love it. Right in this video here, we're talking all about keto and keto for women, the thyroid, how that is impacted, the role of exogenous ketones in improving our metabolic flexibility. Such a juicy conversation. You're going to love it right here. Female physiology is hyper reactive to perturbations in physiology. Female physiology and hormonal balance can be offset by a reduction in insulin. 